Hey everyone, Jason here, founder and co-CEO at MindBuddy Green and your host of the MindBuddy Green podcast. And today I'm here to talk about longevity. This conversation on longevity has advanced by leaps and bounds since we founded MindBuddy Green back in 2009. And while it's great that there are so many evidence-based recommendations on the subject than ever before, it's become overwhelming and impossible to keep up with them all. So much so it can actually add more stress to your life than improvement. This is why my wife and co-founder Colleen and I set out to cut through the noise and answer this question when we began writing our new book over two years ago called The Joy of Well-Being, a practical guide to a happy, healthy, and long life. Practical being the key word here. Now in this book, we've taken 14 years of our insider knowledge, leveraging all we've learned from the best experts in the world and the latest and greatest science and distilled it down just to the most practical info. Essentially, we've done the legwork so you don't have to. We're confident that you can get to 80% of your maximum well-being and help you maximize joy at the same time. And most importantly, if it's in the book, it's got to meet these three criteria. One, it's accessible to everyone. Two, it's science-backed. And three, it offers the possibility of joy. If it doesn't do all those three things and it's not in the book, it's as simple as that. We believe, I believe, and I know you believe that you deserve joyful well-being. So please go to thejoyofwellbeing.com or to Amazon or your favorite book retailer to pre-order your copy today. Thank you so much. I know you are going to love our book with gratitude and joy, Jason. And we know that trauma is not in the event, it's in the response of it. How it gets stored, a heartbreak, like it, it actually hurts in our body and it hurts for some time. Now, that's, that's the reflection of the experience of the event in our body. If we never have the time, the space, the permission, the support, to process or metabolize that. It doesn't go anywhere. It's waiting for the completion of that metabolism. It's like if you've ever eaten too much and it feels like it's just sitting in your in your belly. That's the same thing with trauma, except hopefully whatever you ate, you metabolize through eventually. With trauma, unless we have all of those conditions, we don't, it doesn't get processed through. It doesn't get metabolized. It stays, it's like an injury. Hey everyone, we all know that person with a woe is me mentality. Their life is a constant cycle of crisis, chaos, and stress. They may say things like, it's always something, or why is it always me? Does this sound familiar? Well, according to Dr. Scott Lyon, that person probably has an addiction to drama. And being drawn to drama can have serious implications for your health. Scott is a licensed clinical psychologist and body-based trauma expert. And in this episode, he explains how we all can recover from drama addiction, metabolize our trauma, and break free of the cycle. If you can't ever seem to relax or feel uncomfortable unless you're running at a mile a minute, then you should really give this episode a listen. Scott, welcome. Thank you so much for having me. I'm excited to be here. So great to have you. Uh, really important book, really important message at just the right time, in my view. Addicted to drama, I think we all are. So let's start with your personal story, which led you to becoming a clinical psychologist and ultimately writing this book. Yeah. I always had a love for psychology, but I grew up in the arts and really you know, the best I could do when I was younger, the, the thing I was interested in is kind of how do I infuse this, the psychological processes into my art. And um, then I worked in my 20s as an artist. I was a director. I was a choreographer in New York City where we both were hanging out around that same time. And, um, you know, I started getting into more yoga and mental health. Like I became a dance therapist on the side while I was working as an artist. And then I went back to school at a certain point when I realized I was kind of exhausted, exhausted being an artist and that I found I was kind of perpetuating what the book is about, my own kind of addiction to drama by being in the arts, the certain lifestyle where there's an ease of never being good enough 
And I say an ease because it's so easy to constantly compare yourself to others, to focus on what didn't go well, to really, and in the arts and live shows, things are, there's a constant stream of stressors. And if you want to, it's like popcorn. You can just eat it all the time, all those stressors. And I kind of realized I was like, this is not the life I want for myself anymore. Like I love the arts. I love the, the way in which you can create an experience for other people. And partly I knew that because of my own addiction to drama about how to, how to change the ecosystem, change the environment. But I, I decided to go back and get into clinical psychology. So, I went back to school. And in, while I was in school, I had to pick a topic for my dissertation. And uh, I was choosing between a couple. I was like, oh, maybe I'll do something on mind-body health or yoga. And then I was like, maybe, maybe I'll choose addiction to drama. Like, I, I really recognized it myself. And when I went to go ask other therapists when I was younger and, and then when I would go to the library to look up information about addiction and drama, there was nothing there. And I was like, hmm. That's really interesting. There's such a gap of information because like you said in the beginning, we're all possibly have some propensity for an addiction to drama. And I was like, we all know someone, at least we all know someone addicted to drama, but why is there no support systems? Why is there no research? Why is there no studies that deconstruct what it is and why it is? And so, I decided I'm going to do it. So, how did that show up for you? What did that look like in your real life? Yeah. So, I would say I came from a lineage of uh, addiction to drama. <laughs> so, it showed up in the ecosystem I grew up in. It showed up in my own self. And, you know, I'll name some of the ways it showed up for me and I'll also name the ways it shows up for other people because it's not one size fits all. So, definitely for me, it was things always were more complicated than they needed to be. Things were more intense than they needed to be. They were more extreme in reaction than they needed to be. Sort of the stimulus didn't match the response. So, you know, I make a joke in my book about like blowing a birthday candle out with a fire hose. And that was kind of the way I, I went through life. But I didn't know it at the time. It's not like I thought, hmm, this seems disproportionate. To me, it really made a lot of sense to react in the extreme and the intensity to which I was responding to life with. Um, you know, I, I would get in interpersonal relationships felt really difficult. You know, from the inside, I, I felt like no one ever had my back. I felt like I couldn't ever trust anyone. Vulnerability did not feel safe. From the outside, I would say people might see someone addicted to drama getting into fights all the time, creating gossiping, getting into disturbances where they don't need to be, creating stories, like venting continuously from one person to the next, the same emotional story. I mean, let me, let me turn it over to you for a moment. Like when I, you read the book and um, even named perhaps we're all a little addicted to drama. Do you, do you recognize that either in yourself or other people when you were reading the book? Sure. You know, you know what's, what immediately came to mind with the title and as I started reading, there was a show called Justified on TV that my wife and I used to watch. And the, the lead character uh, was Raylan Givens, played by Timothy Oliphant. And he had this incredible line, which I, I've memorized. If you run into an asshole in the morning, you run into an asshole. If you run into assholes all day, you're the asshole. <laughs> and if you just think about that, because sure, I've had moments where I've had that experience. And then I say, oh, wow. Okay. Yeah. Problems me today. And, you know, I, I'm curious. I, I think, I think it's rare that no one has drama. I think we all have it. We all create stories and unnecessary turmoil and a little bit of suffering for ourselves unintentionally. I mean, like, have you ever gone through a breakup and you went and then listened to a bunch of really sad music? I don't know if you've ever done that. I've, 
I've, or like you're in a mood and you like, and you find the music that sort of accentuates the mood as though to like flood you in the original feeling. Well, well, most of my breakups were in my 20s. And back then, that would just lead me to go out and consume a lot of alcohol and, and tr try to meet someone new. Unfortunately, or fortunately, that was my, my life in the 20s. I've, I've, I've evolved since then and have been very happily married. But yes, I, I get your point. So either to numb or distract, which is the, the basis of it in addiction anyways, not to say you were addicted, but it is the basis of what addiction does. It's a distractive technique. So you can flood yourself with more feeling as a distractor. You can go drink alcohol as a distractor. They're all variations of tools to prevent you from being in the depth of the emotional pain. And so when do you think, and look, some element I think is healthy and normal, in your opinion, when does it cross a line to becoming an issue? Yeah, that's a great question. I mean, there's, we all are going to, when it's habit, when it's reflexive, when, you know, one of the main characteristics of an addiction and drama is that it is almost impossible to find stillness, settling, relaxation. Like you do a meditation class and you start to find settling. You start to find some relaxation. The weight in your body starts to release. Your thoughts start to drip away. And for those of us who have some propensity or are addicted to drama, it's all of a sudden you're thinking about that fight from the other day. You're thinking about all the things you have to do. You're revving yourself up from that, that settling that's possible. And, and, you know, when that's chronic – it means that we are never actually resting and restoring. We're never regaining vitality in our cells. And so we rely on the stimulus of stress to maintain a way of being awake in the world, a way of functioning in the world, like over doing coffee, except instead of drinking coffee, you're creating the conditions or seeking out the conditions of stress. And flooding yourself with that that cortisol, that that adrenaline. So, are there specific questions one could ask themselves if they're listening? Of like, okay, some of this is resonating. Like, is there a checklist, or there's questions I should ask to to really do an assessment of where I stand here? Yeah, I mean, on my website too, there's a, a assessment you could call it, or an, a questionnaire. You could say it's like 13 questions. It's a it's a miniature version of the one in the book. And, and those are some questions you can ask yourself of like, whether it's someone you know, you know someone addicted to drama, there's a, a quiz for that. And then there's a quiz for it. I'm asking for a friend. We're all asking for a friend. I, never me. <laughs> um, yeah, I mean, like on the outside, do I know someone addicted to drama? It's like, have you ever thought in your head or said out loud after interacting with someone, whoa, what just happened? How the hell did we just get there? And why am I involved? If either of those three questions are kind of on repeat with, a, with one particular person, that's a good indicator that, they're, that you're with someone who has an addiction to drama. Um, if you find yourself going personally, uh, why is it always me? It's, or even saying it's always something. There's, sh there's always something that's going to go wrong. That's also a good indicator that you perhaps also have a propensity for drama. The mentality of it, the negative bias that keeps you really focused on the what can go wrong, what will go wrong, how someone injured you uh, emotionally, physically, as opposed to focusing on how this other person really supported you today or how this experience really made you feel good. You don't, you know, especially if you grew up in a household of chaos, you're not given the luxury to focus on the good. You're not given the luxury to re settle and relax. It's not safe. And, and, you know, what most people don't understand in terms of an addiction to, to drama is that we're really identifying that we are using the drama to avoid the trauma. And it's a distractive technique like any other drug, gambling, sex, alcohol, um, 
cocaine, heroin, they're means to fill a void and keep us away from the underlying emotional pain that we've walled off, protected, and numbed out as a means of preservation. So what about the interaction, which I've certainly had, and I'm sure most people have with, with a friend or acquaintance, and you say, you know, how are you doing? And there are some people, it doesn't matter what's going on in their life, they'll always smile and you know, everything's all, you know, all good, but, you know, whether it could be a shit storm or catastrophe, it doesn't matter, it's all good. You the overriders. Get, the override, you kind of get that canned response. And then you've got some other people who will immediately go to, well, you know, this thing or that thing, there's always something wrong, even if things are generally good, rather than focusing on, you know, we're pretty good, but you know, I'm really struggling with Johnny over here or... You know, have you figured out these guys, you know, I'm waiting in line for coffee. They can't figure out how to do the latte right, right. But, you know, it's all, it's all good. I still love this place. Uh, but, but there's always something to kind of... Uh, to focus on, to rev oneself up. Yeah. So, what's the happy medium? And let's talk about both. You know, I'd say there's three people. There's, there's a, it's all good. There's, maybe it's good, but I'm going to talk about something that isn't. And then there's like the, you know, the... <laughs> The, the appropriate response, which I don't know what that is. So, there's dramatic narrative, there's suppressive narrative, and then there's reflective narrative. And these are all different narrative styles. Dramatic narrative is going to focus on he said, then she said. It's going to focus on the other, what they did, what they didn't do, as opposed to reflective narrative. That's really going to focus on when this happened, I felt this. And now I'm feeling a little sad. I'm feeling a little left behind. And I'm in reflective narrative, just like that style that you were talking about, that happy medium, I'm using the, um, the experience, the conversation to co-regulate myself and process and metabolize the experience. In the dramatic narrative, I'm using the opportunity to rev myself up and pull someone else in to my dramatic experience and use them like a battery pack to keep going, to roll down the hill of drama. And there's a reason for this. It feels powerful. It's, a, it's, that, co it's that caffeine kick I was talking about before. I feel energized. I feel alive. I feel something above the threshold of numbness that's essentially been embedded in me to protect uh, myself from feeling the underlying pain and trauma. So, when you talk about underlying pain and trauma, I think about root causes and I'll, I'll segue to my six-year-old real world example from last night. She can't find uh, an item of clothing and then quickly gets so worked up and upset and she has a habit of doing this and we ultimately find it and, and then it's all good. <laughs> But, you know, regulation, it's a big, you know, at this age, they're, they're working through that and, you know, trying to stay, stay calm, even though sometimes it's very difficult when she's screaming, where's my top? Where's my, I'm like, well, we're going to find it Didn't go anywhere. Not a big deal. Just a, just a piece of clothing. Some people don't have clothing. You know, I don't know if that's the right approach, but I try to like build in a lesson of gratitude in there. Uh, so where I'm going is it seems like some of this stems from childhood and, and 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 what happens where um, hopefully my six-year-old when she gets this at some point snaps out of it while others don't this idea of regulation and she's trying to bring me into her uh i don't even know what you call it yeah before we talk about that i want to go back for a moment to talk about the the third piece you asked about which was the, re the repressive and no, it's a great question and then i want to deconstruct your daughter with you and the <laughs> The, so, the, the suppressive narrative is exactly what you named. It's all good. Things are fine. It feels, it's a flat, it can sometimes be a flat affect. There's di it feels like there's a distance between what the person is experiencing and what they're communicating. And that can often lead into two similar things that happen in addiction to drama, which is either a cathartic explosion because there isn't the processing or a collapse. And, and then, so it ends up kind of in a similar place as the very, you know, expressive, intense, negative focus that comes often with an addiction to drama. 
And again, the happy medium is how much do, can I be in relationship to what I'm feeling and express it so it can be metabolized, processed, and moved through? Am I either avoiding it or feeding off of it? And in either of those cases, it, does, it leads to dis-ease. We know that it, suppression repression leads to higher rates of anxiety because the signal of your body to say, hey, something isn't right will start to get louder and louder. And that signal, another term for that signal is anxiety. And for those addicted to drama, where they're feeding off of it, they never get to attend to the core feelings and needs that are underneath. And so, there's more suppression repression that is also happening. And so, it, it really kind of mirrors, you know, there are two, two polarities, but they actually end up uh, in very similar situations in the end. Interesting. I, let, let's, I want to come back to that, this idea of disease in the body and storing trauma. I think that's really interesting and an important topic. Um, but but let's bring it back daughter. to the, yeah. Well, and, and I don't want, I, my daughter's amazing. I don't want to pick no, up my she daughter. sounds but, great. But I think it's, yeah, not great at 6 p.m. last night. But, not great at 6 uh, p.m. But I think it's symbolic. Like, this is not a lot of, this is part of being a toddler and then young child and evolving. And eventually you have to snap out of this, so to speak, or grow out of it. Or not. Some people, or not. <laughs> yeah. I chose not to until my late 20s or the early 30s or maybe my 40s. Who knows? We're not going to talk about it. <laughs> um. Yeah, I mean, here's here's a beautiful example of like, you know, yeah, as we're growing up, we don't have all the built-in regulatory skills. We're learning that. That's part of what happens through co-regulation in our infancy into our early childhood. Of like, I'm I'm unable to regulate myself. So as a caregiver, you stay available, present, engaged, expressive. And I feel the groundedness within your body, which eventually allows me to be with my experience without losing myself. And that's what, you know, co-regulation is. And, and in this example, you know, where, where it tips over is you're giving all these co-regulatory cues. You're like, we will find it. Your voice is steady. Your voice has a clarity to it. Your body is present. And when they can't register any of those cues of co-regulation and they can't, they can't receive them, they can't be validated from them, that's when we know, that's what also mirrors an addiction to drama. Because those who are addicted to drama can't take the vulnerable approach of receiving so often we might think, oh, they just want attention. They're just in it for the attention. Your daughter was just like freaking out for attention, which is we know is not the case. Um, but the reality is, for those who are addicted to drama, you have to, you know, you have to soften enough. You have to lower the sort of a drawbridge of your castle to let people in, and that's vulnerable. And that level of vulnerability is not safe for those who have experiences of trauma in their background. And so, they can't actually receive that co-regulation. They can't receive the support you're offering. They can't be validated in their experience because they would have to be vulnerable and that vulnerability makes them susceptible to the next bad thing that could possibly happen. The next negative experience, the next trauma. They can't be on guard like they need, they feel like they need to be. And, and well, for, for children, in your experience, is there an age where they really start to evolve and make progress here? Is there like a hard, like, is there a hard and fast, you know, by age nine or five or, or it's a process and everyone's unique? Do you have a teenager yet? I can't remember. No, thank God. No. Okay. Well, we will be friends for a long time. <laughs> Teenage years. I feel like, I, you know, I said in the, there's a story in the book about a teenager and my mom saying, you know, Scott, teenagers invented the addiction to drama. And it, it um, yeah, you know, I, there, 
<laughs> if you've ever read any of like Dan Siegel's work on like what happens in the brain, it's kind of interesting, especially around what happens in the teenage years. But like I, I, I haven't quite made all the neuro links yet, uh, the neuroscience links to like why, why if why in the teenage years does it get bigger, more intense than what you even see in the toddler years? I'm assuming all the hormonal changes play a significant role. Then there's a uh, there's a lot of pruning. There's a lot of hormones. There's a lot of things that challenge regu- self regulation. And um, and there's also this. I mean, it's this very fragile period about being seen and um, the vulnerability of being seen, especially through puberty, and wanting to be seen simultaneously. And you know, it's like if you grew up again in a house of chaos, and a house of chaos can be a house where there's absolute repression, like we were talking about, where there's no emotional expression, where there's no connection. And a house of chaos can be doors slamming, fights, um, you know, it can be in environments that essentially feel toxic. It can even be in systems where it's like loud noises on the outside, like if you live next to a train. And what do you need to do in order to be seen and heard and witnessed? Because these are fundamental needs. These are primal needs to feel safe and survive. And so, we might start to like, for me, I was sick a lot as a kid because I also knew that that was one of the ways I could garner my parents' attention. Being funny and provocative was another way. It was that became our currency for love because that's how I, re- I, I registered, oh, that's when I receive attention, when I'm sick, when I'm um, in trouble when I'm really provocative and funny. So, you know, I think you're hitting on, obviously your family upbringing plays a significant role, uh, which I think most people would agree with. And then there's the generational trauma, the sort of inherited, you know, Gabor Mate has talked about, you, know, you touch on the, this idea that there, there's just trauma in your, your, your DNA, if you will, that kind of gets passed on from generation. You want to spend a moment on that? Yeah. We know that's, that there's a propensity in the gene expression for things like anxiety. We know that certain experiences will turn on or off genes and that expression gets passed down through lineages. So, um, studies where, I mean, you and I were both in uh, New York on September 11th, 2001. Uh, you were going to work. I was going my first day of school. And, um, and we have seen the studies that those who were in proximity, who had a greater rate of trauma from the event, that their children have higher rates of anxiety. Those kids did not go through the experience. Those kids were both around the ecosystem of their parents and the expression, but it was also demonstrated that it was a genetic um, a genetic process to which that gene expression that got turned on from the traumatic event got passed down. And we've seen that through so many other studies um, where there were big, you know, big natural disasters or uh, famines in which the kids had a higher rate of um, depression and anxiety, even though the kids themselves did not experience it. And this is where it gets complicated. Because it is harder in some ways to do trauma therapy work when you don't have the event to go back to and link the experience, the, the sort of baseline level of anxiety that becomes status quo to something. Of course. You know, we, you know I don't know. I'm making this up. I don't know that my father was abused by this person. He never talked about it. I have no idea. You know, maybe you know, someone goes to a, a shaman and... and- <laughs> In the jungle, and that's maybe, I don't recommend that, uh, and that, and that comes out. But that, that's to me because look, I, this is my a big question of mine. I think when we start to look at trauma in with generational trauma, you know, obviously the the big trauma that we experience is is very clear. I think it's very clear, easy to identify. 
And I think we all suffer from the little T. It's everywhere, specifically now culturally with social media and the, the world moves so fast. And we'll talk about what's going on culturally. But then when you, we start to get into intergenerational trauma, I say to myself, I don't know a human on earth who does not have trauma. No, it's part of our inheritance at this point. And then the question is, you know, obviously I'm getting to the, you know, you wrote a book, Addiction, Addic Addiction to Drama, and trauma plays a significant role. Uh, you know, how, like the storage in the body, because we think about, you know, where I'm going with this, we are not doing well as a society in terms of our, our lifespan has decreased, obesity, diabetes, we, we all know how bad the numbers are. And obviously nutrition and exercise play a significant role, obviously connection, loneliness, mental health epidemic, all play a significant role. And then I look over here as like this wild card of like collective trauma, intergenerational trauma. How do we measure this? How big is this problem over here? I think it's pretty big. And I want to talk about the body and storing trauma. And as you pointed out, disease, it's very Louise Hay of you. <laughs> We're buddies. I actually don't know her. <laughs> uh, but you know who I'm talking about. You can of course. Yeah, yeah, yeah. No, I grew up with her tapes sure, as a kid. Sure, yeah. sure. Uh, and it's the it's idea of disassociation from that. But like, so long-winded way of, of, of the impact of the body and to me, the, the unintended consequences we're unaware of. What, what's, can you talk a little bit about the body and your view on how we store trauma and the unintended consequences as we face a, face a health crisis? Yeah. Well, like I said before, the, the easiest thing to measure is like, here's this event. Like it's this natural disaster. It's this, um, it's this ab abuse process, a pattern or experience. It's this, these particular things. And we know that trauma is not in the event, it's in the response of it, how it gets stored. So things can move through us. You know, I say, hey, I don't, I don't like your mustache. You don't have a mustache. And it's like, you're like, I don't have a mustache and that's silly. And it just kind of moves through you. But if I say something and it stings, You've, we've all experienced something that sort of stings. And I'm, I'm, I'm talking about, I'm going to lead up to the bigger idea of trauma here, but it's like, ooh, or a, a, a heartbreak. Like it, it actually hurts in our body and it hurts for some time. Now, that's, that's the reflection of the experience of the event in our body. If we never have the time, the space, the permission, the support to process or metabolize that, it doesn't go anywhere. It's waiting for the completion of that metabolism. It's like, it's like if you've ever eaten too much and it feels like it's just sitting in your, in your belly, that's the same thing with trauma. Except hopefully whatever you ate, you metabolize through eventually. With trauma, unless we have all of those conditions we don't, it doesn't get processed through. It doesn't get metabolized. It stays. It's like an injury, for example. When we, when we have uh, an injury, like you're uh, a basketball player, you're an athlete. When you have an injury, what happens is you, there's an inflammatory response that comes in. It's a fluid inflammatory response. I mean, that's what inflammatory is. It's a fluid response that builds a buffer of protection, right? And so that you don't continue to injure the area. Now, what happens in that is that if you don't nurse it back to health, that inflammation essentially stays there. And that what ends up happening is the cells in that area continue to have their metabolic process. So, you release like the cellular poop or you know like <laughs> there's better ways to say that but like cellular poop is a, my favorite way of saying that all the <laughs> all the carbon dioxide all the metabolic waste and um that starts to build up in that area and because of the inflammation there's no flow so that metabolic waste that carbon dioxide all gets stuck in there and becomes a toxic environment that toxic environment then gets registered as pain and if you think about the same thing, we have this hit 
this experience like an abuse or a natural disaster, it has the same physiological process. We have a, a, a experience. If it doesn't get processed, we have an inflammatory response to protect it. We call that numbness. We call that dissociation. We have lots of different ways of protecting essentially or disconnecting from the, uh, the intensity of that pain. And over time, that becomes a toxic environment in the same way. And it gets registered as pain and dis-ease. Right. So, you know, I, I know we, we joked about Louise Hay. For, for those unfamiliar, Louise Hay, you know, she passed away, I think, in the last few years, the founder of Hay House. And she wrote this book, You Can Heal Your Life, which did have a profound impact on me. And essentially, the concept of Louise Hay and the book and her life is all uh, disease or, or all health issues stem from, you know, some sort of trauma, anger, suppression, repression, et cetera. And she even goes through in the book, there's like a, a, an appendix where every single illness and she ties it to something, which you know, I found some things to be interesting uh, and, and on point and other things maybe taking it a little too far. And, and her, she also claimed you know, she essentially had cancer and became healed uh, without any medical intervention. And I think this is, so this is where I look, I think, you know, trauma, anger, repression being stored in the, the, the body and leading to z z disease is interesting and, and real. But I also struggle with kind of the onus, the, the pressure that puts on the individual where, oh, it's my fault or, and... <laughs> why I'm struggling with, you know, cancer or, or whatever the, whatever the issue is. Um, and, you know, I'll just take a step back. I think it's real, but I, I struggle with how does one work through the process if they're facing an illness, whether it's serious or not so serious of this is the trauma, this is the spot, this is what the experts say it's associated with versus like the medical intervention, what the, a psychiatrist may say or a functional medicine doctor. Yeah, I, I agree. I mean, I, I, um, it, it, it always pained me to, to, to take that. It felt like too big of a idea that, the, that all disease is because of you it 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 really kind of felt like i know it could bring up a lot of shame yeah and in some ways it's empowering it's like all right i'm in control and, and there was an affirmation attached and you know I'll, I'll give my example so like when i was going through my lower back issues it was attached to like the root chakra and uh struggles with with money and at that time i was like oh wow this is really on point uh but there were also structural things that were happening in my body uh, but I, I think, I guess where I'm going, maybe there is no answer. It, it is interesting and just trying to, you know, as we talk about inter intergenerational trauma and the body doesn't forget, uh, how one can really deal with that. Is the recipe affirmations combined with yoga, talk therapy? I mean, we haven't even talked about psychedelics yet. <laughs> Um, I think that there are a lot of entry points into creating the 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 conditions to allow something to process and metabolize. Now the challenge though is when again, if you have a pattern of feeding off the intensity, feeding off the stress, feeding off the rage, um, and it makes it harder to get down into the well of what is actually underneath it and process it through. And this is why, you know, an addiction to drama is a little bit more complicated because it's actually, it's preventing in a very significant way from going down in and, and completing what hasn't had an opportunity to be resolved. And, um, 
You know, I, it's interesting because I, when you were sharing that, it makes me think of a. I had a very dear friend and teacher, and um, she had cancer, and and when she passed, I had another friend who said, "Oh, what do you think it was that she never processed that gave her the cancer?" And I was like, "What the hell? Like how fucking insensitive?" Oh, sorry. How no, insensitive? All, all good. I've, I've already cursed. I blew it. You've already cursed. It's it's an explicit show. Um, like, how the hell could you say that to someone who's mourning, let alone like project that on someone else? I'm like, this this human being was one of the best therapeutic teachers I've ever met. Like, I don't, you know, and I've known her for, since I was 16. At which yoga class did this person share this with you? Yeah, right. <laughs> <laughs> and um, it was, you know, it was really insensitive. And I was like, I, I understand the perspective, but I also am like, uh, you know, I think there's a happy medium here of going, disease also does happen. Like we live in ecosystems, we live in environments that have, I mean, if you, you know, New York City, what's in the water sometimes? <laughs> you know, like those are those pipes that she lived in, in that pre-war building were pretty damn old. I'm, I have no doubt there was lead, you know? Um, so, it's, you know, I, I just want to name that for, for people who are listening because I agree. I think it's, I think we've moved away from that sort of, I, I think that there's a little toxicity in that perspective. Um, I think it, it can be helpful as a point, a reference point to then start to come inward and process. But if we take it as an absolute, it can lead to a lot of shame. Yeah, it's very, uh, you know, back in like the 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 2010s when I was going to yoga all over New York City, it felt like a very like New York City canned yoga response to, to someone who's experienced or, or West Side of LA canned yoga response. Uh, and I love yoga. Uh, but w w so where I'm going to go with this is something I've definitely noticed over my 14 years being embedded in this world, which I very much love, is there are definitely a lot of people who you know, are very passionate or maybe obsessed with health and well-being and perhaps using this, you know, it's become an extreme pursuit of health and this notion of hiding in that pursuit of health. Can we talk about that? Yeah. <laughs> yeah, I can, I can happily share a story about that. Um, when I was in my late twenties, I, I had hit my rock bottom. I, um, was in grad school. I had broke up with my long-term partner. I lost a big job. Um, I lost my health insurance because I, you know, it was like one thing after the next, and and it all was sort of simultaneously in, in like a very short time span, actually. And um, I, you know, I I had already gone to school for to for dance movement therapy. I had been involved in yoga since I was 15. I had I had read a book or two in my life. I, I listened to Louise Hayes tapes while going to sleep, you know. And, um, and I remember saying to my therapist at the time, I was like, how can I be such a mess? Like, how can I not be able to get up in the mornings? How am I so dysfunctional? I do yoga and meditation all the time. This should have prepared me. And, um, and, and why am I noticing all these other patterns now of how I have created my own suffering? Like what, what? And she just said probably the best and rudest thing I could ever imagine, which was, ah, oh, meditation and yoga. What a beautiful place to hide. <laughs> <laughs> and it's something, I don't know. It was like she broke an iceberg that was over me. And, and like, I just was, I cried. I really, pro like, I was like, oh my gosh, I can see how much I was hiding in, in the, the, the doing the action of. Like, I wasn't actually doing it to, like, bring me more contact with myself. I was forming an identity that created a little, and then a mentality that would allowed me more distance from myself in a certain way. 
And then I started to notice all the other ways I was hiding from myself, including this addiction to drama, that this was such a reflexive, adaptive survival strategy that kept me further and further from myself and further and further from other people. And it, it was, you know, you talked about earlier, like loneliness. This, it, it, it made so much sense why I always felt so lonely and disconnected why I felt like a walking ghost as a kid, because I was so disconnected from myself. I, I was so disconnected from other people, but I didn't realize that my own mechanisms for protecting me from all the, the shit I went through as a kid, the hardships, um, actually were creating the wall that divided me from myself and divided me from other people. I, I also, what comes to mind, to me also is the power that a teacher in our world has, whether it be a yoga teacher or a meditation teacher, and also recognizing they're human. And, you know, it's very easy. You walk into a yoga class, maybe you're struggling with back pain and then your back pain goes away. You're dealing with something and, and you, you forge this incredible connection with the teacher. And it's almost like a, let's go as far as like a Pavlovian response. This person says, do this, you do that. You, the person says, do this, you do that. It feels good. And then ultimately, then there's also, in some ways, these people are preaching a sermon. And an example comes to mind. Um, there was a prominent intuitive slash acupuncturist in New York City. And he had to, <laughs> he had to, he had to leave a, a practice because he, every woman who was coming in, he would end up essentially telling them to leave their husband. And what was going on is he was struggling in his own personal relationship and that just came through. And that's an extreme example, but this idea that, you know, we are looking to this person for guidance, but this person's also a human and can't, it's very hard for people to kind of check that at the door. At the projecting door. their own process. Exactly. Yeah. <laughs> exactly. It's like therapy. No, no. One Oh one. Well, yeah, and I think also whether it's yoga or meditation or whatever it may be, I think, you know, people are looking for healing, people are looking to get better. And if someone has that impact, people are also looking for, you know, guidance and tell me what to do. And that there's also like this power dynamic. And, and with teachers too, I, I've seen it. Sometimes it's totally unintentional. It just kind of happens. You get all these people hanging on every word and it's like, oh, okay, this feels good. What else can I say? We all want to feel better. Like we all want to feel better. We all want to feel more optimal. We all want more ease and less stuckness and frustration and agony and loneliness and all those things. And I think the challenge is, is you know, there there is no universal pathway to that. So, yeah, how do we get it? We want the ease. We want all this good stuff. We want the ease. We want to feel good. We want less drama. How? how what are the secrets? You seem to have figured it all out. You're in Miami now. I did. I, I I figured it all out. I'm I'm no longer an asshole, and I've just live a life of ease. Come follow me <laughs> on Instagram. You know, I think I think the, the the most fundamental thing I have learned and and do as a facilitator, as a therapist, as a coach, is helping someone in to their own awareness, into the way that they are not uh, that their particular way of, of creating their own suffering, creating their own challenge. And I, and I don't say that in a shameful way. I say that as a empathetic, compassionate recognition that we all have our adaptive strategies. These are the ways we adapted to life. And what, and, and we're individual in that there's no universal adaptation. It's like um, the, we might move into a particular direction, like an addiction to drama or an addiction here to alcohol or um, to, to become reclusive or, you know, there might be familiar, but the, the exact ways in which we are stuck, the exact ways we don't feel ease are individual to us. 
And so if I say to you, hey, to find ease, you must go dance naked uh, on your rooftop in the full moon 20 hours a year. I mean, that might have worked for someone. That might have even worked for me and I have done that and it's fun. Um, but if I say like that's the universal way, then I'm not helping someone meet themselves and in that meeting of themselves, finding their own path, their own embodied experience towards their own revelatory ease, their own revelatory uh, comfort. And so, here's kind of a more scientific example, for example. For example, I'm just going to say for example too many times. Um, so, when we have a trauma and I, I'm not, we, we have, you know, I've already said, okay, there's an event, there's an impact on the body. Then there's a whole other process in which we are adapting, which we are changing our entire physiology, our perception, our way of orienting to the world called survival adaptive technique strategies in order to protect ourselves from the past, but also from the next possible trauma. And on what that looks like is for, you know, and I found this often in those with an addiction to drama, that their senses fully change, the way they see, the, the filters to what decibels they hear, the particular taste that they become more attuned to, like bitter, or what's for sound, higher tones, which are more associated with threat sounds. Um, visually, they're more in a tunnel vision, which is what we often get as part of a stress response. So, we're more looking for things from that frontal and don't have that open, expansive view. Um, same thing with uh, uh, the filters of what they're smelling. And all of these things, these ways in which they've adapted, then say what information they take in. And the information they take in informs the way they not only experience, but perceive reality. And then I react, I build patterns, I build behaviors based on the way that I experience reality. Even if those behaviors create more stress, more suffering, more loneliness in the long run. So you mentioned the information we take in. And, you know, I, I think culturally, I think globally seems like we have some issues here with regards <laughs> to the information we take in. What, what yeah. are the things we should avoid if we can or minimize in our lives to help avoid drama? Definitely podcasts. <laughs> <laughs> no, just kidding. I, I, you know, what we're, we're beginning to go into, I think, is the ways in which uh, our our media culture has now replicated the conditions that form an addiction to drama. And part of that is, is the mass amount of intake. We are becoming overloaded in our nervous systems, which is what also happens in trauma, especially in early developmental trauma, when we don't have co-regulation with a caregiver or our own regulation to process and metabolize it. So, we are being chronically overstimulated with devices that are dramatic. That's language, that's imagery, that's sensationalism, that's violence, things that are more intensified and extreme to maintain or to capture and maintain our attention. That's the, that's the purpose of it. But what it does is it floods us. And if we're not in this, in this where we have space, time, uh, support to process what we're being flooded with, guess what? It gets stored in the body and becomes heavy and toxic. And that is what we are in a serious endemic of. And then what do we do? We become tolerant to it. So, we know that it takes more sensationalism, more intense language, more violence to capture and maintain someone that someone's attention now than it did eight, 10 years ago. We have studies that identify that. So, it means that we as a culture are not only being overstimulated, but we're building tolerance levels to it. We're becoming numb to what we're intaking. 
you know, let me let me share yeah. a statistic with you. Uh, I love statistics. Go for it. So my <laughs> wife and I wrote a book called The Joy of Wellbeing. It's coming yeah. out on May 23rd. I will have to send send you the book. We're here to talk about your book. But uh, one of the <laughs> we'll statistics- We'll go out to dinner. And we'll, we'll go out we'll to dinner start. in Miami. Yeah. <laughs> when I'm here to convince you there's great dining in Miami. So I'm here to be convinced. <laughs> so one of the statistics we share, which I think is symbolic of the very problem you just clearly outlined, Wharton did a study on the most emailed articles in the New York Times, essentially the most viral articles, most widely read, and they characterized the articles by emotion. The top three emotions were anxiety, awe, and anger. Number one was anger. Anger increased virality by 34%. In other words, the, the, if an article caused someone to be angry, that article was more likely to be read. That translates to shared engagement, ultimately revenue. And I don't think that's unique to the New York Times. I think it's on social media. I think it's everywhere. So if you just take a step back and say, we're living in a media culture, a media machine that is incentivized by anger. Mm -hmm. Anger, awe. Oh. Intensity. Yeah, all of those, they're all emotional devices that are part of this drama cycle. Because what happens is, whether it's anger, whether it's awe, whether whatever, we become tolerant to it. And then we need more. And then the bigger challenge is, is then we need, then we start to go with to withdrawal symptoms that look like anxiety and boredom. And so we need more to feel more. And so we're in this chronic cycle. And in this chronic cycle, we start to, because uh, withdrawal also looks like relaxing. <laughs> and so we stay out of relaxing. And where that becomes more of an issue is in the same way those who are, have an addiction to drama, if they start to settle, they start to find stillness or ease, they have an activation reflex, a stress reflex. It's like an alarm that says, hey, this is dangerous. This is dangerous. You're going to get bored. You're going to be vulnerable. And so, go seek or create more stressful conditions to rise above. And that is exactly what we're seeing on a mass scale. So, how do we break the cycle? We don't. No, I'm just <laughs> Can you imagine if that was like, and that's the end of the show. Good luck, everybody. <laughs> um, you know, it, it, it's going to involve more conscious marketing. And, and that's a really challenging position. Or, or how does one catch oneself if they're watching the news or they're, or they're doom scrolling on Instagram and I, I, or, 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 doing whatever they whatever they do scrolling trolling i don't think we have any trolls on the we don't have trolls we got a we got a good good community of listeners here uh but but someone just you know or or you know just like scrolling amazon or net or whatever their thing is or content how do you catch yourself and break the cycle well i i like to ask the question when are you informed enough so, if you find yourself watching two hours of news, reading the newspaper, checking it on your phone, what are you informed enough? Because you, it's important to recognize that you're going, there is no neutral read. There is no neutral scrolling. There is no neutral experience. Everything that you are looking at, reading, hearing, you have a physiological response to. And if that physiological response is anger uh, or anxiety, you're likely to pay more attention to it. So, to even know that is like you, to start to become more tuned to your body to say, when is enough enough? When have I gotten enough information that I don't need to keep flooding myself with more? And to become tolerant to not being constantly flooded with stimuli, to become more flexible, I would say, with having some moments in your day of quote unquote boredom or less stimulus and starting to find that there's a richness in life that doesn't involve the, the intensity, the extremes of what's being fed to you. Because just like 
your example of the New York Times, you're right. The the art the the the, so, the social posts that are most likely to get shared and liked are ones that have more emotional intensity to them, ones that make you feel something, and it takes more to feel more. So what's needed what what content creators have to do to continue to get the likes to uh, is gossiping is all of these dr drama tools to essentially keep you interested. And that's great, maybe, but that means more is coming at you. On that note, I think you had an interesting concept in the book, weaponized empathy. Weaponized empathy, yeah. Weaponized empathy. So, when, before when I mentioned those who are addicted to drama can't lower their drawbridge of vulnerability and take things in. So, essentially weaponized empathy is an eye for an eye. That, that sort of a, a approach, a phil philosophical approach in which I say, okay, you, you hurt me. Jeez, and and, and um, you say sorry, but I actually can't receive your sorry. I can't receive you because we don't, I, I don't have the vulnerability to take in what you have to offer, the connection. And so, the best way that I can get you to understand me is to create the conditions in which you will also feel what I perceive as the same amount of hurt. So, I might start shaming you. I might start bringing up the past of that time that you did this and you did that. I might start bringing other people in to kind of attack you as well until we are at an eye, what I perceive as an eye for an eye. And it also makes me feel closer to you, which is the crazy part, is that suddenly when you are aligned with my pain, that, those, that's the moment where we, I feel, as, as someone who's addicted to drama, in sync with you. It's the same reason, in the same way, those who are addicted to drama might stir the pot, create chaos in the environment, so that the ecosystem and the people in it feel the same anxiety, feel the same duress as I do. And that is suddenly the moment where I'm like, there's no more dissonance. There's no more cacophony between different um, where my dis-ease inside is so different from what's happening outside of me. Suddenly, the world feels safe because it's in sync. It feels justified. It's intense. And we all, <laughs> and, and, and now that like I'm deconstructing it, you might go, oh, I can see when that friend did that. Like they just couldn't take an apology. No matter what, what you offered them, it was always a lose-lose situation. So, you know, in deconstructing that friend, I think we all like to put people in buckets. Yeah. We, we all love a good archetype and you've got we some, some good, <laughs> we just love a good archetype, good grocery list, good, good, good grocery list, a good archetype. And you've got some common archetypes in the book. So can you, can you share yeah. a few of those common archetypes so we could start to put our, our friends and family yeah. in boxes? <laughs> well, <laughs> you know, archetypes, um, are really there because it's, again, it's not, an addiction to drama can look and manifest in a lot of different ways. Yeah. And so, um, it, this was my way of creating, you know, when I created these archetypes of going, here's how it might look like, and here's another face of it, and here's another face of it, and here's another face of it. Um, so, of, of the 11 archetypes, um, I'll read them and then we can pick our favorites and deconstruct them. Yeah. And by our favorites, we, I mean, how we each, where we see ourselves. <laughs> of course, of course. Of course. I'm asking or, for a or, friend. Or, or our partners. Yeah. Or yeah, a friend. Yeah. I'm asking for my six-year-old. <laughs> um, the first is an external rever. So, revving is the act of pulling things in, stimulating yourself uh, into a stress response. And so, an external rever is really crisis hopping. They're focusing on the outside. They're gathering, here's what they did wrong. Here's what they did wrong. It's very external based. They're looking at what's happening around them as the stressors to essentially pump themselves up, get that hit of stress. 
Um, then we have uh, the center stager. And, and that's where they, you know, I think what people typically think of as someone who's addicted to drama because they have to be the center of attention. They really, um, they might even say they're shy, but they, they feel it, it, their sense of importance, their sense of survival rests on feeling seen. And the extreme to which they will feel seen is what we call like the center staging. How do I get myself spotlighted? They, they might be really focused on how many friends they have or followers they have on social media. They might be really attentive to how do I, I don't know, get more friends? How do those friends attend to me? How do I pull them into my world, my drama? How do I entertain them? We, we all know a good eruptor. So, that's an archetype <laughs> who I think we were talking about one earlier in the show. <laughs> <laughs> where it's like out of nowhere, all of a sudden it just goes from zero to a hundred and there's an explosion and it's intense. It can, it can be violent. It can be emotionally violent. It can be throwing things. It can be vocally very intense and violent. Um, and that's toddler syndrome. A toddler syndrome. It's uh, yeah. Beautiful. It's like the adult toddler. And you know, this is to say like uh, there are times even, up until my mid thirties where I would have, I would pull out the archetype of the eruptor. And it's like, it's, it's as though from the inside, it's as though something just takes over and you're just like watching it and you're like, Oh no. And it, it's like, you're being puppeted by your own uh, internal <laughs> adaptive survival strategies. It's a joy. <laughs> um, the victim I think we we all might recognize that archetype uh, of especially in addicted drama. It's like, why me? Why is there something? Why does bad things always happen to me? Um, they're not really able to take in the good, so oh, they are only able to filter in the bad. So it does feel like the world is against them, because their sensory apparatuses, their eyes, their ears, their smell, their taste, is focused on negative information. They're going to be overwhelmed and it feels like the world is against them too. So, the victim and that's a, you know, it's a, I think it's fair to say it's a hard thing to be around someone who really perceives no matter what the condition or the situation is that they were being wronged. And there's not a lot of ways to change their perspective. It's, there's not a lot of ways for them to say, hey, here's how you contributed to this. Um, the drama bystander. Now, um, this, this is an interesting one because this is not necessarily the person who's addicted to drama that we, we typically think of because they're around people who are addicted to drama. This is the bystander. This is the enabler. This is someone who puts logs on their fire. Um, this is someone who often complains, uh, oh, they're just so stressful and they stress me out. And I'll say to you, I'll say to that person, why don't you stop hanging out with them? Oh, because I like them. They're my friend. If I left, they would get mad. And I'm like, where, where is your attachment here? This is actually your addiction to drama. You're just using them as the, as the main drama uh, pillar, so to speak. Well, you just sort of ride their roller coaster. Uh, the catastrophizer. So again, this is like bad things are ap are uh, bad things are always happening. They're intensifying a situation. Um, they're making a mountain out of a molehill. Yeah, it's like um, my mom didn't call me when she said she called me, and I'm like, "Are you okay?" I thought, I thought you might have gotten into an accident or, you know, like blowing things up, catastrophizing. Um, there's the internal rever. So, that's really focusing, oh, I have this back pain. Does that mean I have cancer? Um, or I, I'm feeling a little anxious. I'm getting anxious from my anxiousness. You know, they're, they're monitoring their internal processes and using that to rev themselves up. The dramatic narrator. We talked about the dramatic narrator earlier. Um, he said this and then she said that. 
uh, often there's a lot of gossiping as part of the dramatic narrator. Um, the the martyr, so the martyr and the bystander are a little close, except that the martyr's focus is more about like, if I leave this person who's addicted to drama, they're not going to be able to be okay. If I leave my toxic relationship, ooh, they might hurt themselves. And they might. There might be truth to that, except they're using their martyrdom to stay in the stress. They're using that as the excuse to continue to get that hit of drama. Um, <laughs> the attachment seeker. Ooh, this is a fun one. Um, if you've ever asked yourself, why can't I just find a good partner? Like, why are why are all men just suck or why do all women or why do all these individuals just like suck at relationships? It's kind of like that saying what you were saying before. It's like, if I run into one asshole during the day, they're the asshole. But if I run into 10 assholes, I'm the asshole. So, it, it's this, it's like no matter what relationship they get into, it, it's the same unfolding, the jealousy, the backstabbing, the intensity, the high highs, the low lows, the roller coaster of relationship. But the attachment seeker is always unable to register their own, their own contribution to the suffering and the intensity and the extreme of these relationships. <laughs> and they keep focusing on like, if I just move over to California, there's better people there or... You know, it's, it's, they don't recognize wherever they go, there they are. They need to move to Miami. That's <laughs> where all Maybe. the good people are. Broad state. <laughs> there's no bias there. Um, and then there's the storyteller, which is, um, this is the individual who's constantly retelling the same stories over and over again in their head or, and then, or to other people. So they're venting constantly. Um, I might say to you, this person is like, oh my gosh, I went to the uh, market and there was a super rude clerk and I can't believe how rude they were. And then I'm in the bathtub and I'm thinking, oh, this is what I would have said to the clerk. And this is da, da, da. And then the next day I'm like, oh, I'm talking to my friend who I haven't talked to in a week. And I'm like, oh, yesterday I saw this clerk. And then I start making up other things of like, I bet he doesn't even brush his teeth. I'm just like, I mean, I'm making weird stuff up now, but I'm just like inventing narratives or um, it's, it's also like, it's, it's similar to the catastrophizer in that way uh, where they're really creating stories. Um, you know, like you're not, you haven't spoken in a minute. I, I, my story is that you find me really boring. And not only that, but I'm really upset that you find me so boring. And I might just get off this podcast right now and and never talk to you again. And that dinner we were going to have, it's over. Wouldn't that be something if we just ended the show right now? Should we? <laughs> no. <laughs> Keep going. <laughs> so, this really happened. And, you know. We have to show meta examples of how drama unfolds in real and in, in vivo. You know, else it's, you know, we're not doing our job here. Um, so... Those are just different ways of going, oh, yeah, I, I do see that that aspect of myself or that archetype in myself, or I do see that archetype in my friend. I, 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 you know, it's a way of deconstructing all the different variations or incarnations of how drama might show up. Wow. Those are, I, I definitely, I, I have to watch myself with the internal rev every once in a while. You know, specifically in our world, you know, I talk to people all the time who, you know, have struggled with various weird illnesses and, and I've struggled with various weird health issues, although I'm very healthy and I wear the wearables. And every once in a while, I have to watch myself from not, you know, what's okay, what am I really, let's just take a moment and relax here. Don't go to Dr. Google. <laughs> I I'm not an internal rever. I'll say that. And, you know, I, I, I can appreciate, first of all, I appreciate your vulnerability of sharing that and um, appreciate that as your a strategy. Uh, I, I recently went to um, overseas and got very sick. And, um, and 
I, I didn't get great news from the doctor. I mean, I knew what it was. It was a pretty bad case of parasites. And, and the, the doctor was very intense. I was like, okay. And she was like, doesn't this concern you? I was like, no, I'll deal with it. And, and then she, when I saw her the next time, she was like, have you been thinking about it? It's just like, are you, you've been ruminating about it? I was like, no, should I? <laughs> and she was like, I would. And I was like, well, you're an internal rubber. I, <laughs> I've got other, I like to, I like to create stories. All right. <laughs> but um, yeah, we all have sort of our own and our own strategies and that our own tools. And it all leads back to that same thing of the way in which it keeps us further and further away from processing and being present with the sort of primal feelings and needs that have been so protected or repressed or suppressed uh, as, a, as a means of survival. So for any parent listening, I'm sure they're thinking this, this, this will be my last question. How do we raise drama free or drama reduced? I don't know if drama free is possible. Drama reduced kids. What does that look like? Any tips? Yeah. I was just talking to my sister about this <laughs> who has a teenager. And one of the things is the same strategies I use as a therapist, I would offer as a, um, to, to working with kids is like, first, I'm not, I'm going to stay here. I'm not going to interrupt and say you're wrong because that's actually throwing logs on their fire. It validates that they're not seen, they're not witnessed, they're not heard and know that they are in their own spiral and they likely can't get out of it yet. So, there's a way in which you need to let them just hold space for what's going on, but not, not enabling them, not going... First of all, I'm not going to go, yeah, you're right. Your clothes are missing. That's terrible. Like most parents wouldn't do that. But like, I'm not going to enable them as a strategy either. But I'm also not going to be like, you're overreacting. I might say things like, it's really intense. How like the, it feels really, I hear you. It feels really intense not to have your clothes where you want them to be. I'm, I'm using somewhere in the middle of going, I'm, I'm validating their story enough to let out a little steam. And I'm not denying them and I'm not enabling them. That's an important thing is um, uh, to, to sort of shift the system. Um, you know, that, that's one of the biggest pieces I would say. And, and, the, and I don't want to say mistakes, but things I see like my, my sister and I were talking about, she was like, I try to just stay cool in it. Like where her husband just is like, you're overreacting. And that just blows things out. And my sister used to say like, she used to try to be her friend and like get involved and, and really like go into the intensity with her. And, and she was like, that just seemed to make it worse too. And so like finding that middle ground of being like, again, identify the points. If you can get them to slow down, that's a big thing. So, I might say to a client, and it's a little harder with a kid, I'm like, I really want to hear everything you have to say because everything you have to say is important. I'm wondering if we can slow it down a little bit. What's that last sentence you said? So, that they can also start to hear themselves because it's kind of a disembodied process. They're like spouting it out. It's all erupting. So, if they can get some reflection back to themselves as well, Usually, it can it will start to stop the rolling down the drama hill. Give them space to process the things that are not in the heat in the throes of drama. Like, how are you feeling? I'm oh, like and going back and using those old school emotional charts, like having them point at anger. Where is that in your body? Is there a color to it? Is there a voice to it? Is there something that anger wants to say so that they're not building up? throughout the day or throughout the week until they get into those heated drama cycles so that we can start to metabolize and process through the entirety of their week as well so that they're not using stuff to build it up. Fascinating. Uh, love the book, Scott. Thank you so much. My pleasure. Thank you for having me.